I just gave everybody a sketch of the future. Fill in some of the gaps. Well, it's an exciting future. Uh, we've been working hard for the last 10 years on a technology that literally lets the car drive itself. No human in the car at all. That sets up a world where you can design the car under the assumption that you don't need a driver. And that takes us to a point where you take a lot of parts off the car to put some parts on to drive it. But most importantly, I think it puts us in a world where we get the crash out of the automobile transportation system. You believe that? Of life. Oh, I absolutely do. I ride in these cars regularly. The technology has progressed dramatically since uh, it was first tested in the 2007 time frame. What's going to be the interim period like once these cars are allowed on the road? What is it going to be like when driverless cars are interfacing with cars being driven by humans? Well, it's going to be much like what we see today because this car will actually be safer than a human-driven car. People are not very good drivers, quite honestly. There's 33,000 hey, right calories here. a year in the U.S., 1.2 million worldwide. So the idea here is to have sensors, things like lasers and radar and cameras and computer processors that basically do the driving task better than what a human can do. What about the implications for the automotive industry? If you've got a car that doesn't need a driver, in theory, it could be driving around all the time. And if that's the case, ah, you mean in sharing. theory, we wouldn't need as many cars. Is that is that? What's going to happen? Uh, we'll need a lot of cars to move the miles that people want to travel, but the car will be used up much faster. So a shared car in this capacity would have 80,000 miles a year put on it versus your car, maybe 12. Also, the car may not be quite what we know it has today because it would be designed without the steering wheel, without the brake pedals, the accelerator pedals, all the gauges. And a lot of the part of the auto industry where they make their money is these differentiated products. So they'll sell you an up-level engine, an up-level sound system. So it is really What does that mean? What does that mean for Ford and General Motors and Audi and BMW? Well, I, I, think, I think all of those companies need to be asking a couple of questions. First of all, is this technology real? I have to believe it is. How soon? I think proven in three to five years, regulations will gate that time frame in the market. And if it happens, what does it mean to us? And it could be a world where people are buying trips in miles and experiences and not cars. And other people are wanting the cars to provide the service. What does it mean for the insurance industry? Well, that's another great question. Imagine waking up one day and realizing cars aren't crashing, or if they do bump into each other, the crashes aren't very severe. I think the insurance industry needs to be thinking about assurance as well as insurance, uh, assuring things go well as well as protecting against things going wrong. Mike, why don't you jump in here? Who, who wins? I mean, at CLSA, we have an auto analyst, and we have an internet analyst, we have a Google analyst. CLSA is hiring all kinds of analysts. Who should be covering the space? Consumers. In the well, uh, I, I, among the companies who win. The right. First of all, the consumers are the winners. There's a lot of people who are not well served by automobiles. Either they're too old to drive or too young or they have a disability. Beyond that, society wins quite a bit because you can tailor the design of the car now for most of the trips that you take. 90% of trips are one and two persons, so why are we running around in these 4,000 pound, four to six person machines when we could be in 1,000 pound, one to two person machines? So society wins, but the real winners are the ones that know how to do this and the brands that can deliver those services. So our, our, our auto analyst thinks that it's the auto suppliers that win, perhaps the Googles and Apples, more than the traditional automakers. Do you agree with that? Well, yes, there's I, a yes. surprise. Apple and Google win? Weird. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, I do agree with that, Michael. I, I believe um, if you're not developing this technology, I'm talking about really a car that does all the driving. Now, auto companies are doing a nice job with safety features, so full-speed range adaptive cruise control, forward collision warning, lane keeping, but that all assumes the driver stays in the loop. So now you're adding things to the car which make them more costly. So I believe the companies that can prove the car is driverless change the game. Why? Because we're tethered to that car, driving the car. Our time, a median income person at $25 an hour going 25 miles an hour values their time at a dollar a mile. And you can price for that. And that's where the value comes from. Larry, what about the kind of company that many people see on the vanguard of auto technology today? Tesla. Well, they've done a fantastic job, and it's a beautiful product, and certainly they're But do they survive about, in this world? Oh, well, they, they certainly could. They're, they're moving fast toward their own driverless system. Uh, they've made some comments about that. Um, but I think you're going to see some, some players teaming up here down the road. You're going to have some I great think. brands, and you're going to have some great technology, and I think there could be some possibilities for, for that future. Like whom? Like just to get our head around, what kind of partnerships could we see? Well, if you had the capability of, um, of driving a car driverless, would you necessarily want to carry all the 
structural cost of building automobiles. Is that where the real sweet spot's going to be? I think you want to look at return on assets here. So all of those questions remain to be answered, but I think there's going to be some very interesting disruption in business models as well as in the technology. What's a more, what's a more transformative force? The driverless car or the car without an internal combustion engine? The, the driverless car. And the reason it is is because it sets up an opportunity to get the mass out of the car. The reason cars are so inefficient is because when you burn that gasoline, 75% is lost as heat, 25% turn the wheels, you weigh 150 pounds, the car weighs 3,000 pounds, only 1% of that energy is moving you. So now with the driverless car, when you get the crash out of the system, you can get the mass out of the system. That makes the battery more practical. The problem with the battery is the big car, not the battery. <laughs>